Um, all right. Well, on that note, um, I think that we have Toure with us. Uh, he's been waiting patiently, so I think we'll go ahead and bring him on out. Uh, Toure Reed is a professor of history at Illinois State University. He's the author of the book, No Alms But Opportunity. And of course, his latest book is Toward Freedom, The Case Against Race Reductionism, which came out last year. Toure, welcome to The Jacobin Show. You're, you're no stranger to the channel, but welcome to the show. Hey, well, thanks for having me. I uh, enjoyed listening to you guys. Uh, and I, that was probably the best lead in I could have imagined. <laughs> oh, <Great>. thank you. <laughs> on that note, are you a class reduction? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends be... on who you ask. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to be quoted in that quiz that Jen asked our audience right. yeah, to exactly. make, I think. <laughs> Yeah, we'll find some choice lines from Toward Freedom. Yeah. Um, so on, on the subject of the book, uh, you wrote Toward Freedom in the lead up, of course, to Bernie Sanders uh, 2020 presidential campaign. And uh, you argue in the book that his campaign uh, sort of in, in some ways represented this kind of revival of a uh, New Deal era sort of public goods framework. Um, now, between then and now, there have, of course, been several momentous events, uh, most notably the pandemic and the subsequent economic crash, um, and then last summer's so-called racial reckoning. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think these events have changed the political landscape between you crafting toward freedom and now. Wow, that's a lot. I know, um, yeah. We're just starting off small, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start easy. Um, it struck me, and, it, and I don't know that you guys would agree with this, that the summer of the Great Awakening was quite the backlash to um, the Sanders campaign, right? Obviously, Sanders was over. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. Uh, so I haven't been living under a rock, as some people might suggest. But rather, the zeal that that coalesced around Sanders in support of kind of social democratic politics, obviously out, outlived his campaign. And it again struck me in real time that what the, the, the reason, one of the reasons that the mainstream media was so invested in pushing what was fundamentally a kind of race reductionist discourse with respect to the pandemic, which was something that I think Jen, you uh, discussed earlier. Um, but but also the George Floyd murder and a host of other issues was to to displace uh, you know that kind of social democratic sentiment that still resonated with a lot of voters and to kind of discipline, if you will, uh, those voters to um, insist that in continuing to embrace what the mainstream Dems would have called the class reductionist discourse, and this is, you know, the way that the class reductionist framework operates and continuing to embrace a social democratic kind of discourse or demands for redistributive uh, economic policies, that those activists or voters who embraced, again, uh, you know, continue to embrace redistributive policies were in some way being disrespectful or uh, living uh, in a kind of denial about the crucial importance of racial injustices in America. And it was a fascinating thing to watch in real time because again, in keeping with the great lead in, um, you know, proceeded from the standard view that racial issues and economic issues exist on entirely different planes. So that was the first thing that comes to mind for me with this. Mm -hmm. Can you go into some examples of some like classic race reductionist policies or platforms maybe recent ones that have come out of this, but also historically? Well, um, I guess the most recent uh, publicized example of a kind of classic race reductionist policy proposal is the catch-all reparations uh, discourse, right? I mean, I don't know if that's what you had in mind since, uh, you know, right now, reparations is still kind of a catchphrase, but the insistence that, again, the problems that African Americans face are owed to a kind of trans historical racism that exists apart from political economy uh, helped to fuel this push for reparations that really took off in a big way a couple of years after Tana uh, after the publication of Tana Coates's The mm -hmm. Case for Reparations. Uh, so that is the kind of you know present omnipresent uh, example of a race reductionist 
set of policy proposals. I guess you can't call that a policy though, because reparations means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it's one that we're living with. Mm -hmm. There's the, I think HR 40, is that what it's called? That's mm -hmm. exploring, ex exploring the possibility of reparations in a vague way, but the intention is there. It's a heart centered approach to oppression from the Congress. I right, guess. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to just add on to that, that um, when I think when the pandemic began, um, I it, it kind of seemed like even the libertarians had accepted that there needed to be some sort of government intervention. And at least for a moment, it seemed like uh, uh, the spell of austerity maybe not had been maybe maybe it's too strong to say that it had been broken, but that, you know, there was some more momentum toward kind of pushing uh, or implementing certain services, um, helping out people with direct cash payments. Like, I don't know when the last time we saw those was. Um, and also uh, like people stopped complaining about the deficit at least for a little while. Um, so I'm wondering, like, I'm wondering if you see a possibility for keeping that momentum going in some way, or if you feel that the kind of turn toward more particularistic solutions that you were just talking about has supplanted that. Well, I guess it's okay if I'm terribly pessimistic, right? Um, <laughs> so so I, I think that uh, in order to make the case for continuing a kind of social democratic, with with a, with a kind of social democratic politics, um, that's a long fight, right? Because at this point, it seems that the other side really has crowded out space for this kind of class politics um, that would benefit working people, irrespective of, of race or gender or sexual orientation or fill in the blank. So I, you know, I'm pretty pessimistic about our prospects, but with, with, the, with the caveat that the needs, the real needs are still here. Right. I mean, that hasn't changed. And if anything, the real needs maybe have gotten worse or, or more um, acute. Uh, and so that requires on the part of those of us who are on the left, I think, uh, you know, commitment. Right. I mean, commitment, resilience in the face of the charge of class reductionism, among other things, which is obviously intended, as as I think one of you had, had mentioned earlier, intended to really push back against this politics is kind of politics that black Americans had actually long embraced, uh, but would benefit from disproportionately. Yeah, you know, some people have been saying that the latest uh, stimulus package is a return to Keynesianism. It's targeting lower class people, um, people who are poor and uh, middle class. It's in some way a uh, gesture towards wages for housework. We'll see how that actually pans out in the end. What do you make of this? Do you think that the Democratic Party is kind of nodding its head towards these classic Keynesian, Keynesian interventions? Um, and will they go further? Or is the left going to have to fight tooth and nail for some real robust um, po redistributive policies? Well, I think I think you have to fight, but um, at least for the time being, I think Biden has staked out some reasonable positions as it pertains to labor. I mean, his his support for the PRO Act is pretty significant. Um, we'll see what happens with with the PRO Act. And likewise, mm -hmm. we'll see how what what happens with the stimulus when all is said and done. But I think the fight over the stimulus highlights the the major problems. Right. I mean, the fact that eight Democrats or seven Democrats and an independent mm -hmm. uh, opposed, you know, increasing the minimum wage to, to $15 an hour uh, says quite a lot about the challenges within the party. Right. Uh, and of course, the fact that Republicans are ardently opposed to it, despite the fact that the majority of voters, uh, and I think this is the majority across partisan lines, or at least the majority of Democratic voters and a very large plurality, if not a slim majority of Republican voters think the minimum wage should be raised. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, and I think that is actually grist for the mill for people who want to push for a more, you know, egalitarian uh, form of government, right? Because mm -hmm. I think the reality is with a lot of people who are Democrats and Republicans, they're attracted to the parties for brand recognition rather than, you know, committed rather than being committed ideologues. Mm 
Um, it's what you know, like people in your community or people you identify with identify as Republicans or Democrats, and you kind of go with the flow. And, I, and in fact, I'll just belabor this point. Uh, several years ago, I had an argument. Uh, an argument would imply it was heated. I had a pleasant <laughs> disagreement uh, with, with a Republican who was really ardently anti-Obama. This was in 2012. And what her issue was, was the ACA. And she opposed the ACA because, you know, it was socialized medicine. And I said to her, mm -hmm. and she, you know, purportedly embraced market-based solutions to healthcare. And I said, well, if you really sincerely embrace market-based solutions to healthcare, then the ACA is your guy, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, it's essentially the brainchild of the Heritage Foundation. And of course, your presidential candidate in 2012 right. implemented mm -hmm. A you know microcosmic version of the ACA uh, in his state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and yet because of the partisan lines, she couldn't see that for what it was, right? And by the same token, as and we can recall this um, on the other side, many Democrats who understood themselves to be progressive in 2012, you know, embraced the ACA as if it were somehow some progressive kind of politics, and since then. You know, so much of the discourse about healthcare it coalesced around making the ACA better. But again, I mean, I think that example highlights the kind of brand attachments that many voters have to to their parties, and hence this this disconnect between the policies that many Republicans purport to you know embrace, like in, increasing the minimum wage, and what their actual representatives do. And for us on the left. I think that's actually a ray of hope, right? I mean, you could mm. conceivably, you know, lead with issues, uh, at least certain issues, uh, to to deepen support for these policies, which which would be necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I guess I so have I a sort of more general uh, question now, or it's a little more abstract. But um, during the Great Awakening, as you've called it, um, a lot of corporations sort of rushed forward to proclaim their uh, opposite or to, to condemn, uh, quote, structural racism or systemic racism. And, you know, obviously, in the case of the corporations, that I think, I think they specifically chose that term because it's sort of vague enough that they could condemn, you know, structural racism, uh, while also not implicating themselves in whatever that structural racism is. Um, but these are also terms that we hear a lot on the left, of course. And so I, I'm just wondering, like, can you give us a sort of working definition? of what structural racism is and then following from that like does it does it not follow that we need race targeted solutions to combat that structural racism so jen you're trying to get me in trouble with people <laughs> I, I really am like, yeah i mean i'm hip to your game and i'm, I'm hip enough to your game that I, that i am not on twitter so <laughs> You know, actually, Ariella and I aren't either, so yeah. I think we get in trouble way more than we actually know about. But I <laughs> think so too. You, you can't <laughs> at me though. I'm not addable. <laughs> actually, I, I just so, want to mention quickly that somebody once yelled at Paul, who is on Twitter, about us. Ariella. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So but I like anyways. it when people complain to our manager. Right. I, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just send all complaints to Paul. <laughs> so I have to ask before I answer your question, and I swear I'm not like trying to to run the clock on this, but uh, <laughs> what was the complaint about you guys to Paul? Or, yeah. Uh, it was an, okay. So it was an episode that we did on rural America and um, Ariel, do you remember the complaint? I think somebody just thought we weren't, we weren't condemning the white rural poor enough as being racist. Like we were saying like, Hey, they live in hardship too. And I think that the complainant on com complainee on Twitter did not like that. We, we didn't want to go down the path of calling them racist. Yeah, I All don't right. remember the comment. I, <laughs> I'm going to betray everyone in the audience. <laughs> the only comment that I forwarded is someone being like, can you fix the captions on your videos? Because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. The other ones, I, I do get told a, a lot in the comments that I look tired and that I'm mispronouncing things, I think, or saying filler words. So, you know, those are those are other complaints we get. Like, well, um... Send it to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, I will just concede that I look tired because I had four hours sleep. But um, I will segue into now answering your question. So just to make sure that it's 
quite apparent that I wasn't trying to, <laughs> to run the clock. So I would submit that the appeal of constructs like structural racism and systemic racism is twofold. One, racism is real, right? There's no question about that. Uh, and you can say that if there's been one positive thing that's happened over the last few to several years is that we've kind of moved beyond this silly bullshit post-racial framework, right? Mm -hmm. And I've um, said in print, and I'll say it everywhere I can, uh, that I was not very high on President Obama in 2008. Uh, in fact, that I, I was a critic of Obama in, in 2008, partly because of the post-racial framework, right? Because it struck me that practically post-racialism wasn't really post-racialism. What it was, uh, because o Obama remained attached to racial tropes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. underclass ideology was a major component of President Obama's post-racial vision. And underclass ideology is a way to talk about poverty that's not about political economy, but it's about culture. But the way that practitioners of underclass ideology uh, define culture is really a lot more like race than it is culture. So, you know, the post-racial framework was, which was really more post-racial post-racism is what it was, mm -hmm. uh, because Obama was really essentially admonishing Blacks to stop complaining about racism uh, as the source of their problems, right? As a source of African-Americans overrepresentation among the nation's impoverished or racial profiling or, or, or whatever. Stop talking about racism and instead focus on your behavior, right? Stop eating mm -hmm. Popeyes for breakfast, pull up your pants. And, and stop eating Popeyes for, for breakfast was literally one of one of his spiels, mm -hmm. um, turn the TV off, read a book, blah, 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 right? So it's nice to see that fade, at least, because post-racialism in 2008 was obviously a reactionary fantasy, which was one of the reasons that I was dismayed at the time by how many other well-educated Black Americans I knew who were very excited about President Obama. And I, I will tell you just to... Um, anticipate the class reductionist charge that I can imagine <laughs> coming my way. I thought in 2008, and I said this to my dad, I said this to all my other black friends and even my good white friends, am I the only black person in America who works with disingenuous or knows disingenuous white liberals who are attached <laughs> to Obama's <laughs> post-racism, you know, which is what post-racialism is, partly because it functions as a, as a case against affirmative action, right? Because I heard that a lot. From mm -hmm. white liberals uh, in that in that you know era, right in the, at the start at the dawn of Obamaism, so right then and there you would think that that would you know provide me a little bit of insulation against the charge of class reductionism, but you know I know it won't um, because I will segue now to the problem with structural racism. <laughs> I've said in a couple of different interviews uh, that structural racism and systemic racism. And I'm going to just use structural racism to describe both of them because I think they mean the same thing, uh, would be a construct that I think is not very helpful. And I think the construct isn't very helpful, even though racism is real, right? I mean, because I have to stress that, and there's no doubt about the fact that racism is real. I think they're not helpful partly because the construct structural racism uh, is essentially wed to a kind of Patricia Baidal understanding of what racism is. And Patricia Baidal is the um, organizational psychologist who around 1970 or so had come up with the power plus prejudice definition of what racism is, which is a definition of racism that I've always thought was inadequate. At least I probably thought it was okay when I was about eight, when, uh, when my third grade teacher uh, told me that black people can't be racist because racism is power plus prejudice. But then I went home and my dad told me that that was stupid. <laughs> right. So and that was kind of perplexing. But anyway, uh, the that framework, uh, racism is power plus prejudice, uh, is a take on the social constructiveness of race. And the social constructiveness of race is right, right? Race isn't a biological category. It is a social category that functions essentially to designate where people are in the political economy or in the social uh hierarchy, right? That's what the social constructiveness of race basically means. But the power plus privilege take on what racism is, uh, that is an offshoot of the social constructiveness of race, 
is problematic first because it takes race for granted, right? It doesn't, it sidesteps what race is, which is an ideological framework, right? Or a set of ideological attachments, right? Racism would be, I would argue, the belief in biological races. Well, power plus prejudice doesn't even touch what, what that is because it takes race for granted. Um, so you have that problem, which sets the stage for essentializing race. But the other thing is that practically, uh, where the rubber meets the road, the power plus prejudice definition of what racism is really is an individualist framework. And I'm going to funnel this right into uh, structural racism. What's appealing about structural racism, at least one of the things that's appealing, besides the fact that for some, it represents an acknowledgement of the realness of racism. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But the reason that corporations like it, let's say, and their, their HR shills like it, is ironically, there's nothing structural about racism as they define it. That practically what racism is within the framework of structural racism is a collection of individual attitudes, right? Of individuals who have racist attitudes, practically. Because the fixes for structural racism are what? I mean, this is this is my question to you guys, if you've been paying attention, because I don't want to keep talking. I want to be able to um, no. so, Here's my question to you, and, okay. I, and I have an answer. But my question to you is when you hear people talk about structural racism, if you've had to sit through, suffer through, however you want to describe it, anti-racism training in the last several months, what, what did you learn about structural racism and its, its fixes? Asking this to Jen is, is a weighty question because she <laughs> is writing a book about this. <laughs> but Perfect. I, I would say, you know, what you see is, is a kind of, it's part of a, it's nested in a broader liberal, and I, and I don't mean politically liberal, I mean liberal, liberal um, philosophy around how human beings interact and what makes all structures, right? Which is that you have... Um, individuals with lived experience, they take that experience into how they treat other people. The aggregate of that creates the structure, the aggregate of their emotions, um, their affect and personal opinions creates these structures. And that any interventions around racism, sexism, um, homophobia, et cetera, intervene on the individual level. And so you get people who are pushing for, you know, representation or, Let's you know, who imagine that a world of black cops is a world where every cop is great or who imagine that. And, and this isn't just even about race. You see some of this kind of like worker fetishism on the left where they think worker is an identity. It's right. it's grounded in one's experience and all of your politics f flows out of this. And I think there's something redemptive there, even though I think this is wrong which is that human beings like do want to see themselves represented in their political world and in the civilization in which they live. They, and, and to naively assume that those feelings and thoughts that we carry have so much power that that's what's creating it all around us is actually a kind of nice democratic impulse, right? Like it would be great if democratic socialism succeeded and on the micro level, you had control over the th institutions in your world. People want more of a say. And this kind of um, framework is based in that desire, I think. But it's extremely bad at understanding the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, I'll I, throw it to Jen. No, I mean, I think, I think, I think that is a really great way of like capturing one aspect of it. And I think to you know go back to your original question, Toure, like what are we supposed to do about structural racism? Uh, what or what do the people who are attached to this concept of structural racism think we should do about it? And the answer, so far as I can see, is these kinds of like race targeted programs that you were speaking of a little while ago, reparations for one. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people who talk about structural racism bring up redlining a lot. Um, you know, so, so there is the kind of affective part. I think 
there are also some, you know, material inequalities or historical inequalities that that get brought up for sure. Yeah, um, like wealth it, distribution. Exactly. Yeah, the racial wealth gap. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the solutions to address those so-called structural racism issues are particularist. Mm -hmm. Right. And and that's the key point, right? Mm -hmm. That going back to Ariel's excellent excellent. Uh, description of this, right? And that was really great, especially if it was extemporaneous. Uh, you really get it. <laughs> it was a little okay. bit. I t <laughs> Jen and I talked about this weirdly before the show, but <laughs> this is not a prepared remark. Well, it was it was very nicely done um, with minimal preparation about that. <laughs> but but the takeaway here is that what structural racism is practically is the bad you know, attitudes of individuals mm -hmm. in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. And that since what, and, and in fact, so people who hear these criticisms of structural racism as a result, because they, they hear, um, they understand racism to be, again, or structural racism to be the bad actors in the aggregate, that for them, all racism is structural, right? So mm -hmm. if you're saying that structural racism is not the best framework, um, it's inadequate or problematic, then what they hear you saying, even though you're not, or at least I'm not and you're not, uh, there might be some people on Twitter saying this, but it's not us because we're not on Twitter. But what <laughs> they hear you saying is that there's no racism. Mm -hmm. And that's absurd. Who said that, right? I mean, in my yeah. own spiel, and every time I've done this, I've said the same thing, right? I've begun with, there's no question that racism is real, duh. Mm -hmm. Right. And the good thing about this moment is the mass acknowledgement of it. Um, and that's a good thing with with a caveat, though, because then the fixes that we have for these problems, which a are reduced simply to racism, period. And B, what racism is, is and, and structural racism is, is the bad actors in the aggregate. The fixes are all individualist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. ironically, there's nothing structural about the fixes, right? I mean, you fire all the bad actors and replace them with good actors, mm -hmm. or you retrain the bad actors so they so that they're no longer bad actors, but the system remains the same. Right. The structure mm -hmm. of society remains the same. And if you can't afford how you know medical treatment, it doesn't really make a difference, right? If you fought, if you've made sure that the doctor looks like you. If the right. doctor looks like you, but you don't have health insurance, that doctor who looks like you, unfortunately, is going to have to turn you away because mm -hmm. the doctor works at a hospital. The hospital has bills to pay. Mm -hmm. The doctor has bills to pay. Perhaps the doctor has student loan bills to pay, right? Mm -hmm. But but that representation is not by itself going to fix you physically in this scenario. And what you would actually need if, is, you know, national health care, right? The other in that specific scenario. I mean, the other thing, though, and I think Jen might have touched upon this, that's kind of disturbing about the structural racism framework in its moment is that there is this kind of pluralist subtext to it. And in fact, for many, it's not a subtext. Uh, for many, it's actually in the text because there's this, you know, essentialist paradigm that's infused in structural racism. There's a presumption that all black people have the same experience. There's a presumption that all white people, right, are, are privileged within this framework. Um, there's a presumption that all Hispanics have the same experience, et cetera. And of course, that's that's absurd, right? All you have to do is look at if if you if you don't, if you can't be bothered to interact with people, which I think is the easiest way to figure out that not all black people have the same. <laughs> Like maybe talk to some, you know, but, but more than one, right? You're gonna have to go to more than one. Well, well, I know Bobby. Bobby's over. I talk to Bobby all the time at the water cooler. Not during Someone the pandemic. Someone always but. has the straw man black friend who's just like validates it, everything right? they believe. You're like, who is this? And you gotta guy? branch out beyond that one guy. He's he's the black man equivalent of Florida man, apparently. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you just talk to a bunch of black people then maybe what, what would be revealed is the reality of the heterogeneity of experiences and mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, or if you're white, if you just imagine that black people are people, um, sure. you know, sure. like, like white people are people. If you're white, you probably know that white people 
have a variety of perspectives and experiences as well. And you can just extrapolate from that that the same would be true for others. But the reality is for someone like um, Robin DiAngelo, let's say, or even, even someone like um, Edward Benia Silva, they presume a kind of um, unitary intra-racial group interest. Mm -hmm. And that unitary you know, intra-racial group interest is part of the story of the problem of structural racism too, right? Because it presumes mm -hmm. that it gets you back to the problem that the only barriers that black people face are racism, period. And I'm sorry. I mean, if you, if you think about, you know, reparations we touched upon means lots of things to lots of different people. And one of the recurring mantras, because nobody in the policy world is talking about cutting me and Ariel and anybody else who identifies as black, um, you know, a check for eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars. I'll take it if you want to cut it for me. <laughs> How are you going to prove you're black, though? Do you have like a <laughs> twenty three and me to back that I mean, up? Do you have the papers, you know, from the plantation that your family was owned on? Because if you're an African descended black that's not a descendant of slaves, I don't think you'd qualify. I'm sorry. Well, and you know, <laughs> I would I would qualify, but then there's the question of who would come up with the with the paperwork, right? Uh, and yeah. obviously old masters in the gene pool. Uh, so yeah. there's that too. So maybe I would get a diluted check. This is what um, I wonder so. every time I hear that. I've, I've looked at every platform I can think of for reparations because I think it's just an interesting case study in how people understand what race is mm -hmm. and how they right. frame what race is. And, you know, I've been told before in, in getting into these conversations that I have light skin privilege and I need to interrogate this before I enter into conversations around reparations, to which I reply, yeah, from, in some part, the slave owners who are also my, like, I am their descendant. <laughs> Should I answer for that too? You want to put me on the auction block and break down the percentages <laughs> of... <laughs> yeah, that's how you determine how big your check is going to be, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I've, I've heard a whole range of these things. And I, I actually love engaging with the reparations argument because I think it shows a lot of the fantasy around race and how racecraft works in America and also how people understand economic issues. It's this no. very interesting nexus of those things to me. No, that's right. And I want to come back to, to that point too, because the fluidity of race matters quite a bit, um, you know, even beyond the reparations framework, but, but on the reparations framework and Think about it practically, even even after you let's say you come up with the appropriate 23andMe uh, ancestry DNA uh, fill in the blank, you know, criteria uh, for for qualification. The next thing, of course, is we know that no one's in the policy world is talking about cutting 42 million black people a check for nine hundred thousand dollars or eight hundred thousand dollars. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. at least elected officials aren't. The majority of it's not just the case that the majority of Republicans oppose repar reparations, but the majority of white Democrats <laughs> oppose, you know, anything reasonably understood as reparations, right? The cash payout. I think something like 70 percent of white Democrats oppose a cash payout version of reparations, which is why so much of the reparations discourse is centered on rebranding. So mm -hmm. if you take something, though, like one of the 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 new uh, which is not even new right it's it's actually a rebranding not just of reparations but of nixon era black entrepreneurialism but if you take the the calls for uh growing the ranks of black entrepreneurs uh as a form of reparations which has gained quite a bit of traction i mean that's the clearest expression of a class politics and it's not a good class politics that one could imagine uh what is it like the first year failure rate for new businesses is 20%. Mm -hmm. The five year failure rate, I think is 50% for black Americans. The 18 month failure rate, I think is 80% at 70 or 80%, right? The idea that growing the ranks of black entrepreneurs could function as a intra-racial trickle down project, which is what this mm -hmm. is absurd. If only because it seems to presume that businesses are actually in the business of creating good jobs. There was a time where businesses in America created good jobs, but it's not because that's what they were in the business of doing. Mm 
they created good jobs because of the National Labor Relations Act, mm -hmm. right? And that means that the businesses didn't create the good jobs, but the right to collective bargaining gave workers the leverage that they needed to make those jobs that had not been very good jobs, good jobs. But that era had obviously passed, right? Um, the, the labor movement ain't what it used to be. In order to ensure that black people have good jobs, the way to do that is not to grow the ranks of black entrepreneurs, right? I I don't think the fact that your boss looks like you isn't going to ensure that your boss is solvent or disposed to pay you a living wage. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I mean, it's entirely possible that it could even have the opposite effect, depending on the individual in question. Uh, the only way to redress that kind of income inequality would be to take a more bottom up approach, right? Uh, and to establish as a right of citizenship a right to a job at a living wage, right? That could mm -hmm. come in the form of, you know, the fight for 15 um, or more. That could come in the form of a new and more robust union movement. I would say both, but that would be the way to do it. But the reason I'm belaboring this point, though, about the entrepreneurialism as, a, as you know, as, as growing the ranks of Black entrepreneurs as a form of reparations mm -hmm. is it highlights the pluralist presumptions that have dominated this current discourse and that that, that and, and that are bound up in many definitions of structural racism because there is an assumption that all black people share the same interest and of course if you consider that 80 percent of the racial wealth gap um, or 78 percent right if there's a stickler out there 78 percent of the racial wealth gap is between the richest 10 percent of white wage earners and the richest 10 percent of black wage earners then the easiest way to close the racial wealth gap, if that's your metric, and I don't think that that's the best metric, um, if, if that's your metric for you know establishing a more fair and just society, and again, I don't think that's the, the best um, approach, would be to just grow the ranks of rich black people. Um, that wouldn't change the fact that for the bottom 90% of households that, that, you know, black households, that they would still be struggling to make ends meet though, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're just focusing on representation, right? Representation matters, uh, bound up with the racial wealth gap as being the real sign of the disadvantage and the only sign that matters uh, that of the disadvantaged blacks face, then growing the ranks of black entrepreneurs, um, you know, providing support for more black businesses, et cetera, would be a really good way to achieve a statistical victory. That's a statistical victory. Mm -hmm. It's not a real victory though for the majority of black and brown people. People like my buddies, Jason, Miles, Pascal, Robert, and they said they send their regards, or at least Jason, Jen, <laughs> sends his regards. Um, but Cedric Johnson, uh, you know, Barbara Fields, uh, my dad, uh, of course, you know, we're, I think we're all invested in the needs of black people. But the thing that distinguishes us, I think, from a lot of other people who are also invested in the needs of black people, is that we're not terribly interested in, you know, enriching rich black people, right? I mean, I'm interested in growing the ranks of the black middle class. Uh, and I feel quite privileged to have grown up a middle class black person initially in a middle class black neighborhood in Southwest Atlanta. Uh, and then from there, New Haven, Connecticut, which was, you know, a different kettle of fish altogether and not remotely <laughs> affirmed. But anyway, <laughs> but nevertheless, I understand how fortunate I was to have the kind of well-educated uh, parents, black parents that I had, uh, who were lucky because of the fact that they were in the first wave as black boomers. Mm -hmm. They were in the first wave of African-Americans to really benefit materially from the civil rights movement at a time when the Keynesian consensus was still a thing, right? But too many of, of, of those of us today who are invested in, um, you know, this this dominant discourse centered on the racial wealth gap seem not to appreciate the fact that the game has changed profoundly, mm -hmm. you know, since 1950. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so much of this discourse seems to presume that there's actually a growing middle class in the United States, mm -hmm. for, for including a growing white middle class like there would have been in 1950 or 1960 mm -hmm. without considering the fact that more and more whites find themselves losing ground. Yeah. Uh, and that reality means that it's actually not enough to simply fight for racial parity. 
a lot of a lot of the discourse today would have actually made sense, at least to a degree, in 19, you know, 55. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but unfortunately, simply focusing on the disparity is actually kind of a passe argument. And it's fascinating that people it's unfortunate that people don't see that for what it is, because what that means practically, and this is, you know, a failure of historical imagination or whatever. But what that means practically is they're fighting a fight that most that that most blacks aren't going to benefit from, uh, even yeah. as the, the presumption is that most of us will. I, I don't doubt that something branded as reparations might be a thing, but that whatever it is that's branded as reparations would be means tested, targeted programs. And I don't doubt and charity, lots and lots of charity. Mm-hmm. And I don't mm-hmm. doubt that that rich black people are going to become richer. <laughs> so I so, I want to ask, um, um, what do you make of this argument that, you know, what, what, or what, what would you say to the people who are like, well, I want, you know, universal programs and, and ex- the expansion of public goods just as much as the next guy. Uh, but Americans are too racist to ever go for anything like that. I mean, I think that's a kind of like classic criticism that we hear time and time again. And I just want to quickly mention um, Heather McGee, who is the former president of Deimos. She has a new book out now where she sort of makes that claim. Um, let's see. Yeah, she she recently wrote an article for the New York Times, "The Way Out of America's Zero Sum Thinking on Race and Wealth," and it it uh, you know part of it is an appeal to again, like I say, the expansion of public goods. But her argument is that uh, white Americans sort of um, decided decided to forfeit that. Uh, during the civil rights period when it seemed like black Americans were going to have a share in that bounty. Um, and and like I say before, you know, this is this is a classic thing that we've heard about America all the time, that it's just too racist for social democracy. I heard um, this on a Freakonomics podcast like two weeks ago. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, so, so Tere, like, do you have any, like, what is your response to that? And, or, or is there any basis to that argument? Um, I can say that there is a basis to the argument, but I'll tell you what my response is before I get back to, to the basis. Uh, my response to it is, is this. If white Americans are too racist to embrace the very kinds of policies that they would benefit from, then they're going to support reparations. Why? Right? I mean, so <laughs> that that doesn't make any sense on its own terms. And in fact, the irony is I think it's a lot more cynical potentially mm. to say that if you want to grow the ranks of the black middle class, you have to have to nurture a buy-in from whites, which would mean that whites would the best buy-in would not be soothing their souls for, you know, sins that technically they couldn't have, have been responsible for, right? Because nobody alive today knows anybody who owned a slave in the antebellum period, right? So you know, nobody alive today actually is responsible for that. You can say that their ancestors were. That's that's fine. But that's that ends up being a profoundly illiberal uh, framework if you hold people alive today responsible for the misdeeds of their great great grandparents or, or whatever. Right. So. So, again, I mean, the idea that you can't make the case for universal programs because white people are too racist to support programs that they would benefit from. Um, So instead, and I'm not saying that this is what Heather McGee argues, but this is what someone like Tony C. Coates had argued. So instead, what you have to focus on is redistributed programs that only 13% of the population could hope to benefit from doesn't make mathematical sense at all Mm -hmm. Um, because you need a coalition in a democratic state to achieve those policy ends. And since black people are only 12.8% of the total population, and blacks are in fact overrepresented among the poor and working class, that 13% is gonna lose every single time in a democracy, right? The the elements of truth, um, or I should say the basis, I believe, of what of, of that claim uh, as that, that McGee makes, that in the civil rights movement or in the immediate aftermath of the civil rights movement, you could see a, a white backlash. I think the thing that's often overlooked with that claim, because there certainly is a backlash of sorts, is that 
it just so happens that the civil rights movement achieved its last major victory about 15 last major legislative victory um the civil rights act of 1968 we're going to say is the last major legislative victory about 15 years into deindustrialization <laughs> um and then it just so happens that a few or so years several years after that last major victory we we have you know economic crisis right i mean we have stagflation uh, and the oil crisis, and the system's starting to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And one of the contributors to the, you know, animus, the racial animus of that time period is the inability, is, is actually, I think, the collapse of the Keynesian consensus, right? It's not that white people just have these sensibilities that they're just dogmatically attached to, but that backlash in that framework um, around the civil rights movement and the worst of that backlash occurs as the system is falling apart and its ability to deliver for the masses of Americans, the masses of white Americans is starting to, you know, be, be in serious doubt, right? Um, uh, because of, of the rubber meeting the road and the like. So you got that going on as, as one of the factors. The other thing, uh, or another thing, as you move the historical meter up just a little bit, and I, I think it's, um, I think, Sometimes we're not altogether uh, clear about where this backlash, elements of this backlash are coming from, uh, is this. I mean, if you think about this moment now, uh, what we have is a kind of, what's the best way to put this? And I have to think about how to put this partly because of the Twitterverse. But if you think about this, this moment that we're living through right now, um, what we have is a discourse of starkness uh, all the way around. And we the reality of the situation is that Republicans have long treated, I would say, for the most part, quite disingenuously, anti-discrimination policies as evidence of white displacement, right? Diversity, you know, affirmative action predates the defer diversity framework, of course, the diversity framework comes about, you know, sometime after about 1978. But at this point, affirmative action and diversity are interchangeable. And again, and this is an awkward thing to say, and I, and it's awkward for me to say as a defender, and, and I would say a fairly ardent defender of affirmative action. Uh, nevertheless, that discourse of diversity is has been equated, and I'll, I'll, I'll no longer make this passive voice, conservatives had long equated affirmative action with white displacement. And the fact that affirmative action comes online in a real serious way around the time that we have this kind of economic collapse, right? The economic crisis of the 1970s only amplifies these sentiments that I was talking about. And of course, you can fast forward, uh, as I meant to do a minute ago, our historical meter to where we are now that hasn't changed that much, right? I mean, and in fact, in some ways at this very moment, the diversity discourse has become more crass. There is, so again, this is an awkward thing to say, so I apologize for, uh, you know, biding my time and all of the voting <laughs> that's happening. I can't help myself. But it's, it's kind of hard not to hear in this very moment, the reparations discourse, um, in this very moment that's characterized by precarity for not just black Americans, not just Hispanic Americans, but but also white Americans is kind of tone deaf. Mm -hmm. And I can take the kind of out. How do I say to somebody who actually has lost, how do I say to a white person who's lost his or her job, uh, right? And doesn't have health insurance and is, is fretting every day that he or she may you know, contract this potentially deadly coronavirus, how do I say to them from my position as a black tenured professor, <laughs> you know, you really are benefiting from that white privilege, right? I mean, and where's my check, <laughs> right? right. Uh, because right. you're the privileged one, not me, right? Um, and look, privilege comes in, in many forms. And that, of course, is, is baked into the privileged discourse. 
But at this point, it seems that the only privilege that we are committed to is racial privilege, right? And, and maybe gender-based privilege without appreciating the fact that there is this thing called class privilege out there. And that while, be, while working one's way up, if you're a black person, irrespective of sex or a, a woman, irrespective of race, as you move up the income ladder, um, you know, you, you gain privilege. That doesn't mean that you don't experience racism or sexism. Of course you will, right? I mean, that, that is what it is in this moment. But how you experience racism or sexism uh, plays really differently depending on, your, on where you are often enough in the queue. It may not prevent you from being profiled by the police if you're a black person, right? If you're a black person who's, who is in a predominantly white neighborhood or whatever, uh, and the police decide that you don't belong there because you're a black person in a predominantly white neighborhood, they may not notice that you're nicely dressed and that you've got this fancy car that doesn't have the spinning rims and the light package, but you have the respectable version of this luxury SUV or a sports sedan or whatever, and the racist cop might not notice it. But when you look at the inmate population, uh, it's pretty clear what role class plays in how we experience the criminal justice system, right? Because there's most of the inmate population across racial lines is comprised of poor people, right? Mm -hmm. Poor and working class people. There are very few college graduates in prison. They're there, but there are very few of them. And there are a variety of reasons for that. But one of them is, you know, beyond the fact that middle class and certainly upper class people are a lot less likely to perpetrate perpetrate violent crimes and property theft, right? Because those correlate. It happens, obviously. I watch Discovery ID, so I know that <laughs> violent crimes transcend class. <laughs> but... but um, but in the aggregate, the mass wave of violent crimes uh, is is comprised disproportionately by young men who are poor, right, um, and and the like. So, so um, what you find, though, again, is that middle class people, among other things, are a less likely to commit those kinds of crimes. Uh, B, they're a hell of a lot more likely to be able to afford what one of my favorite characters from The Wire would call a pay lawyer, and being able to afford competent legal representation uh, can make a huge difference in outcomes. Uh, it, it might bankrupt you, but it can actually keep you out of, out of prison. But the point is that even if black people up and down the class ladder experience racism, they don't experience it all the same way. And I said on a, on a previous Jacobin related um, or Michael Brooks uh, related interview, I referenced Oprah's handbag controversy from 2013, I think, and mm -hmm. maybe it was in Denmark, uh, where yeah. Oprah couldn't buy the $38,000 handbag. Right. Mm -hmm. And people got mad at me about that. I mean, I don't usually read chats, you know, because I don't hate myself <laughs> that much. Or maybe I do. I just don't hate myself that way. I think that's uh, but when I was glancing through the chats, you know, people got, got some people were, were pissed off about it uh, and insisting that this was evidence of of systemic racism right because black people up and down the class ladder all experience racism yeah. if you don't think i fucking knew that um right and yeah. figured that out when i was 15 let's say in the back of that that squad car um <laughs> on my way home then you're out of your mind uh you know i know that in a lived experience kind of way and it and in fact it's precisely because of my own intimate knowledge with this experientially that I appreciate the class, to, the role of class mm -hmm. in mitigating this damage. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna beat this dead horse uh, just for the YouTube <laughs> and Twitter crowd. <laughs> I didn't shed a tear that Oprah couldn't buy that $38,000 yeah. handbag at that store, right? It was clearly an expression of racism. There is mm -hmm. no right. question right. about that. Was her life impacted negatively by that, though? Right. I mean, that was a humiliation of sorts. Um, and what happened was Oprah was misidentified as a as a black person who wasn't Oprah. She was misidentified mm -hmm. as a black person who couldn't afford that handbag, which is like almost all of us. Right? Yeah, the non Oprah, um, the non of the world. Um, but but again, did that prevent Oprah from living her life 
the rest of that day, having a good day perhaps, uh, and being able to afford a $38,000 handbag at a n purchase from another retailer who wasn't a racist jerk? No. But how many people in, in that era, and I'd said this previously, that handbag cost almost as much as I think the median household income yeah. for a black family of four. Mm -hmm. And what was outrageous about it, and I didn't say this in that previous interview, is that in that moment, the indignity, the racist indignity that Oprah, Oprah experienced became emblematic of all of the problems mm -hmm. of black mm -hmm. Americans. And I'm sorry, that is not emblematic of the problems that black Americans face. Right. That's emblematic of the problems that black multimillionaires face is what that is. And good luck, you know, being a middle class person uh, trying to buy a thirty eight thousand dollar handbag. Uh, so, Mortgage your house. You, it's fine. Right? 